that they have absolute knowledge with no test in reality, this is how they behave. This is what men do when they aspire to the knowledge of gods. Science is a very human form of Science is a tribute to what we can know although we are fallible. In the end, the words were said by Oliver Cromwell. I beseech you in the bowels of Christ, think it possible you may be mistaken. I owe it as a scientist to my friend Leo Zillard. I owe it as a human being to the many members of my family who died here, to stand here as a survivor and a witness. We have to cure ourselves of the itch for absolute knowledge and power. We have to close the distance between the push button order and the human act. We have to touch. That bit is completely unbearable to me. He bends to grab the mud from the pond, except that it isn't mud, it's human ash. That, however many, what, three minutes, is a miracle of capturing somebody's inner angst, Jacob Bronowski's inner angst. I feel sure that if I can connect Bruno's anguish at Auschwitz with his wartime research in which science was used to kill people, I will reach a deeper understanding of my father's complicated attitude towards science. And that is why I'm back where the mystery began, in California. I'm in Los Angeles to visit a Hollywood film director, Mick Jackson. I've discovered that he began his career at the BBC and was behind the camera when Bruno was in front of it at Auschwitz. I'd recognize that knock anyway. <laughs> 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 So Mick, I've come to see you because you actually filmed The Ascent of Man with my father. Could you tell me a bit about what the whole process was like? Was it a big team effort or was, did he lead it? Did he drive it? Um, his ideas drove it and drove us. Were you awed by him at all? Of course, everybody was awed by him. The, the whole crew was awed by him. We loved him. Um, we called him Prof. Let's, um, let's talk about the programme that I really have to tell you I profoundly admire that you actually made in The Ascent of Man, in which my father is in Auschwitz and the programme ends with a slow motion sequence of his lifting uh, ash. Human ashes. Human ashes. Out of a pond. Did he balk at all at going? He didn't want to go. Uh, he was very uneasy about going, and I can understand why. It hadn't been tidied up, didn't have kind of wheelchair access and guide rails. You walked in and you saw these mountains of shoes and suitcases and false teeth and spectacles and things. And then you saw the gas ovens. I mean, it's rusty, but you, probably still serviceable, the crematoria. And this pond at the back, in which, for want of somewhere else, better, they had flushed the ashes from the crematorium. You couldn't help but be affected by it. And I know the, the, the day that we wanted to film, Bruno walked alone around it and saw the same things that I had. But he had to be aware of the fact that he had this reputation of being the man who always had something to say. And he says that that's when the, the quote from Oliver Cromwell came into his head. I beseech you in the bowels. I beseech you. In, and the way he says, in the bowels of Christ, makes me cry every time I see it. And I was there, and it's 30 Think years it ago. Think it possible that you <laughs> are, may, may be, be mistaken. mistaken. I, do you know what? It feels like a message in a bottle to me. 
Yeah, that's, that sense was with us all. I beseech you, in the bowels of Christ, think it possible you may be mistaken. I wonder if Mick can help me understand how Auschwitz and the dropping of the atomic bomb were connected in Bruno's mind. Do you think it's possible that at Nagasaki and at Hiroshima, he had an emotional epiphany, a sense of remorse, that wasn't just about dropping the bomb, but retroactively about the work he'd done on the strategic bombing? It's impossible to deny part of your knowledge of the world when you're confronted by the physical evidence. This is going to sound ridiculous, but remorse is the word that I haven't been finding uh -huh. for that Japan trip. But do you think the remorse is in the Auschwitz scene? He doesn't refer to, to the bombing explicitly, I think, in that, in that piece, but but it seemed to all of us present that that was a genuine expression of remorse, not just for Auschwitz, but for the, the part of the human psyche that could conceive of doing such things. You cannot but believe that they are linked in his head. You actually take the evidence of the, the burnt tissues and you use that as the kind of evidence for the emotional state that you should be in, the ethical state that you should be in as a result of these actions. My father's personal decision after the Second World War was to move on. He chose to shield me, his daughter, from any remorse he might have felt. But it seems that at the end of his life he was reconsidering, revisiting emotions he had buried for so long. I regret I never took this chance to speak about Hiroshima and Nagasaki. I wish I could talk to Bruno now about how he was formed by those wartime experiences, what they meant to him. Fortunately, someone else did, on television. When, in fact, did you first become aware of this uh, extraordinary mental capacity that you have? <laughs> it's one of those wife-beating questions. <laughs> As part of the launch campaign for The Ascent of Man, Bruno was interviewed by Michael Parkinson. Because Bruno died shortly after this, I've never been able to bring myself to watch the show. This is the first time I've watched it through. What happened at uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki was the, the work of men like, your, like yourself. And it comes into this area, isn't it, of moral responsibility? I mean, are scientists really interested in human beings? Or is it just ideas that they're bothered about? One is faced at many moments in one's life between loyalties which are not compatible. Uh, one is faced with a question of loyalty to one's country as against loyalty to one's religion. And during the war, many scientists were faced with a very simple and brutal question, which is, do I feel about the civilization in which I work? strongly enough to do anything to resist the Nazi threat to make a bomb first. And we all felt yes about that. Now, I happen to know that at the end of this Parkinson recording, he collapsed backstage. And I can watch, because he was my dad, as in that sequence, the intensity of feeling is really damaging. He has a heart condition. It's really damaging. I mean, that's what morality is about. That's what being a human being is about. Mm. You are faced with questions of value to which there are no numerical answers. Never think that you can write down an equation which, at the end of which, you say in a satisfactory tone of voice, that's fine, I have now proved loyalty to my country is more important than loyalty to the scientific tradition. Mm. No, no, that's always got to be a person. Well, let me put My father else. takes off his glasses and cleans his glasses in public. That is a danger signal in my father that he is extremely distressed. And he said... Um, suppose it's striking to me that what triggered Bruno's distress was recalling the moral dilemmas faced by scientists during the war. 
Now, if it was applied... I realise he never lost sight of his past. That was why he demanded a scrupulous morality from the scientific community. Because the Ascent of Man came uh, so shortly before his death, and because the big sweep of the Ascent of Man is so affirmative and so bold, that was what I had in my head as what my father believed about science and progress. But what I found, and found on film, I mean, it's not hidden, it's in plain sight, is his questioning and urgent, imploring, really, of the scientific community to live up to the standards that he is proposing for them. I'm now the same age my father was when he made The Ascent of Man and have to face naughty ethical dilemmas in science myself. Since 2008, I've been chair of the Human Fertilization and Embryology Authority, which regulates the sensitive area of assisted human reproduction. Through IVF, science brings hope to thousands of childless couples, but to some, it is tampering with nature. Absolute faith in science doesn't help there. nor when it comes to deciding whether to grant a license for research that may save lives, but involves experiments on human embryonic material. I turned detective on my father, fearing he wasn't the man of integrity I thought he was. Then I discovered how he transformed his remorse for the calamities of the 20th century into hope for the future. I understand now that his optimism was born out of a deep conviction in the rational capacities of humanity. And knowing my father now for all that he was, I can once again confidently make him my role model. My life has been happy. because although I have suffered many conflicts of loyalty, which I spoke to early, I've never had any uncertainty about the meaning of the word good, the meaning of the word true, the meaning of the word beautiful. I've always had a tremendous pride in being a human being and being born in the 20th century. I'm terribly sad that, you know, 30 years from now I shall be dead because not because anybody will miss me, but because I will miss them. Because so many more marvelous things will be known. Now, should you listen to me? Yes. Yes, you should. Not because you have to believe any single thing that I say.